Well, I'm going to start this morning by reading our scripture. It's Acts chapter 17. So if you grab your Bibles, uh, turn them on, open them up, I'm going to read the scripture. But as you're finding Acts 17, let me just make this observation. Here's the, the general sentiment that we're feeling around here. We miss you. We miss you. And as I'm hearing from many of you, you're saying the same thing. We are just missing each other. Uh, the good news is there's lots of ministry happening around Harbor every week. You may not see it and not know what's going on, but there's a lot of ministry happening. We're celebrating the way that God is working in so many different ways. And here's the other piece of good news. It's not going to be long. We're patiently enduring, and the day is coming when we're going to be able to gather together. It looks like first outside, so get your lawn chairs ready. Be watching for announcements, and we're going to be back together soon. And won't it be great to be able to be the gathered church once again? Don't miss out. It's going to be great to be able to be together and worship together as a family. So Acts 17, chapter, or chapter 17, verse 1, let me just read the first 10 verses for us today. Here's what it says. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphilius and Apollonian, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out of the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men have caused trouble all over the world, have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. And that is the word of the Lord for today. I love the little phrase the mob uses in the midst of the riot. Did you read it? It's these men have turned the world upside down, or they've caused trouble all over the world. In another version, it's turned the world upside down. And I sort of look in on that, and I like that. I like that phrase. I like the idea that they were known for this effect they were having, turning the world upside down. And I think something all of us have in common, that something in our hearts is that we want to make a difference with our lives. We, we would like to do something that matters. Now, maybe we wouldn't say we're in the position where we can turn the world upside down, but yet to make a difference, to leave a legacy, even in one person's life or in one area's of life, we long to make a difference to live on purpose. In fact, if you think of it the opposite, if you're doing something and then someone comes along and tells you that it doesn't matter, it has no purpose, it has no value, here's what I know and you know, you won't stay doing that very long. It won't be long before you just move on and find something else and maybe move on a little bit discouraged. As I was reflecting on this, I thought back uh, about 25, 30 years ago when our family was living in Chicago. And at that time, there was a children's ministry program that ran on a Tuesday night. And there was a volunteer in our church, and his name was Larry. And I remember Larry inviting me over to his house. And he said, Jeff, on this Tuesday night, I know you do games and you do a gym time and a Bible time. But he had this vision to do a woodworking class for the children. And at first, when he explained it to me, I didn't quite understand it. But Larry just had such passion and such a heart to do this woodworking class. I said, sure, let's give it a try. And so we set aside a room in this big old church on the third floor, and Larry made that the woodworking classroom. And so that became a rotation. The kids would go in there, and Larry had such passion 
for woodworking. They did birdhouses. They did the coat racks. And then over time, Larry developed this enormous uh, display. It, it was huge. It filled up most of the church's atrium. And all the kids would make little houses. And it was, a, it was like a village at the bottom of a ski slope, like a Swiss village. And all the kids made these little displays. And they put them all together for a Christmas display for a church. And then in the spring, Larry did Pinewood Derby race cars. And year after year, Larry's passion and gift made this woodworking class work. In fact, it became what the children's ministry was known for. So many kids came and looked forward to that and were a part of that. And you know how these things work when a lot of children come. Then those children get older and they go to junior high and senior high. And Larry's ministry was just so significant. And then there came a time when I was no longer there. We were here in Chicago. And I remember hearing the story and, and a new leader came in and he just didn't see that. He didn't see, you know, Larry wasn't teaching a Bible story, and he just didn't see the big picture. And I remember hearing the story and actually reading a little bit of what had been put into writing. And someone had communicated to Larry, and I think unintentionally, that his ministry really didn't matter that it really wasn't that significant. And as you would guess, it wasn't long before Larry was no longer volunteering in that children's ministry there on the third floor in his woodworking classroom. And and what it had been taken uh, away from him, and I always sort of look back on that with a little bit of sadness, because here's what I know and what you know. Larry made a phenomenal difference in his investment, in his passion, and his gifts to teach kids these woodworking skills. Now, here's the point of my message. It's not this morning. Let's all take up woodworking and make a difference. Some of you, some of you would do great at that. Others of you, not so much. But what I do have this morning is one way that we can all make a difference. One way that any one of us, no matter stage of life, we can all do, we can all invest in, and it makes a a difference in people's lives. And we're going to see that today in Thessalonica, this city that Paul goes to. And our series has been following Paul from city to city to city. We've seen his strategy. We know what he does. But today we get to look a little bit under the surface and see how how he did it, what was actually in his heart. And we're going to step away with one simple thing that we can all do that makes an incredible difference in other people's lives. So that's our journey. We've seen Paul's strategy. And now as we come to these next cities, we're looking and asking the question, what's unique about these cities? We already know what Paul does. Last week, what was unique about Philippi was the people that decide to follow Jesus, the people that God works in. But today we see this uniqueness. It's how Paul, it's how he does his ministry there. So you heard the passage read. It's actually a short little passage. Luke doesn't give us too much information there. In fact, if you've been following this series, Paul is following his same pattern. He goes to a city where no one has heard the gospel message. Paul's simple strategy is he just goes to where there's spiritually interested people, the synagogues, and he just shares Jesus with people. I love this strategy. It's so simple. He just believes in the power of the gospel. And what do we see happen in Thessalonica? The same thing we've seen happen in every other city Paul goes to. People believe. And if you look down there, it says a large number of people believed. And again, here's our only God moment, the title of the series, Only God. Paul comes into a city. The power of the gospel is shared, and people see the good news of Jesus, and they believe in him. And then Paul begins to group them together and begins to form a church. We even know where he's doing it. He's doing it in Jason's house. And they went looking there for Paul and for the other believers. That's where he's gathering them. That's where he's teaching them. And then what we've seen in every other city again, there's opposition, and Paul has to flee. But what's unique about Thessalonica is the short amount of time that Paul is in this city. Luke included it there for us. He was in the synagogue three Sabbaths. So just three weeks. And I guess if he got to Thessalonica a little bit before the first Sabbath and stayed a little bit after, he could have been there maybe a month, maybe five weeks. Even if the riot didn't occur right after his third time in the Sabbath, most scholars would say Paul's in Thessalonica certainly not more than three months. It's probably a month that Paul is in Thessalonica. But yet, in such a short time, so much happens in this city. And if you're Paul, just think of it for a moment. You're in a city for a month. 
You begin to form the church together. There's great opposition in the city, and now you're forced to leave. How are you feeling? What's going on in your heart? Well, if you're Paul, you're, you're feeling the same way. You're like, these new believers, we've had a great start, but they're in jeopardy, and he's concerned for them. And so Paul, he gets kicked out of Thessalonica. They go to Berea. He gets kicked out of there. And then he gets down to Athens, where we'll talk about in two weeks. And then in Athens, Timothy and Silas, they come a little bit later. And Paul's so concerned about Thessalonica, he says to Timothy, Timothy, go back up and check on the church. And you just imagine Timothy, and we've talked about him along this journey. He's still a young missionary. He just joined the team. He's like, Paul, I'm just still young at this. He's like, no, no, you head back up to Thessalonica. Or you could hear say, Timothy saying, Paul, we just got kicked out of there. We just about lost our lives. No, Timothy, head back up there, check on the church. And so Timothy does that. He goes back, and Silas goes somewhere else, and Paul leaves Athens and goes on to Corinth. And then in Corinth, Paul comes, and he's there, and then Timothy comes with Silas, And Timothy gives a report on how the church is doing. And he gives, actually, a really positive report. And Paul is so encouraged by this report he gets, he writes a letter back to this church in Thessalonica to encourage them and to continue to teach them. And this is Paul's second letter that he's ever written. His first, we've already talked about, it's Galatians. But the second is written from Corinth to this little church that he was only there a month in, the church in Thessalonica. And if you read it, you just hear Paul's heart of love towards this church. Let me read one verse from 1 Thessalonica. Here's what it says, 1 Thessalonians. Here's what it says. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan blocked our way. Do you hear what he's saying? He's, he's orphaned. It, it was our intense desire to come, but we just couldn't get there. Satan blocked the way in you. Hear his love for this church and his deep love for them. In fact, here's your homework if you want a little homework. Just go and read 1 Thessalonians this week. Just go and read through. You can read it in one sitting. And as you read it, just remember that Paul was only in this city a month. And now he's been separated from a year. He doesn't know how they're doing. And so he writes this letter to them. As you read it that way, it gives such context and such understanding. So here's what I want to do now that you sort of know some of the story. I want to answer the question, how was the church doing? How was the church doing? You've already sensed it's doing quite well. And then the second question is, then what did Paul do in such a short time to make such a significant difference in this people? So first, how was the church doing? And then secondly, what did Paul actually do while he was there for that month? How was the church doing? Look down to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Paul gives us a little statement there. It's hidden in the book. Here's what he says. You'll see the verses on the screen. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Here Paul writes his second letter. When he wrote to the Galatians, he was sort of rebuking them. But he writes to the Thessalonians, and he's like, you guys have become the model you become the model in Macedonia, northern Greece, and you've become the model in Achaia, southern Greece. Think of all the churches. Philippi. Who's, who should Philippi look to as the model? Ah, look to Thessalonica. How about Berea, who we're going to talk about next week? Look to Thessalonica. How about the churches in the south? Athens, Corinth, and the others that are there. Look to Thessalonica. They are the model church. This is the church that Paul is holding up that everyone else should look on. And Paul, if you read a little bit before, saying, you imitated me, and now others should imitate you. You're showing other believers. You're showing other churches how to live out their faith. Paul, Paul commends this church for not only their knowledge of Scripture, but also their behavior the way they were living out their faith. They were a solid church. They were imitators of Christ, and they were standing firm under trial. They're not perfect, but they're doing really well. And as you read then 1 Thessalonians, what you'll see near the end is Paul gives some great teaching too. He comes to the end, and he, and he reminds them what it's like. Uh, he says, here's what it's like after you die. And it's such a great, simple passage of Scripture. In fact, you may be familiar with it because it's a passage we often, we still read today by gravesides. It's such a simple, clear explanation. And Paul still needs to teach him stuff. And you're like, well, why does he still need to teach him stuff? Because he was only there a month. He couldn't teach him everything. 
And here's what we appreciate about this church in Thessalonica. They didn't know everything. They didn't have a lot of time to learn all things. But what they knew, they were living out. What they knew, they were putting into practice. What they knew, they were obeying in Scripture. That's why they're the model church. And then not only are they the model, but look to the next verse. Verse 8, you'll see it on the screens. Paul goes one step further, and here's what he says. The Lord's message rang out from you. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, in Acacia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. So Paul looks in and he says, there's a ringing out happening from this city. It's a broadcast. It's like a reverberation. It's like a trumpet noise coming out of this city. And what is the sound that's coming out? It's the Lord's message. It's the gospel message. This church is truly fulfilling the Great Commission. They are spreading the good news of Jesus. And it's like there's this wider and wider resounding trumpet sound coming out of this church. That that word sort of implies it's a continual sounding forth. It's a constant echoing. It's not just one, one time. But this church was ringing out the Lord's message, the gospel message. So Paul looks in. And he says, I shared Jesus with you, and now you've received my words, but now you're sharing those with other people. Imagine what Paul's heart is, uh, heart is full. He's like, this church now has gone out and shared Jesus with people all in the region where I never could have gone, where I never could have shared, but now that message has gone there. I love this church. You know, they've been blessed by the gospel, but now they haven't. That's not the end. Now they're sharing it. They've received the light of Jesus, and they are passing on that light to other people. If we were going to summarize what we see in these verses, both the modeling and the ringing out, here's how we'd summarize it. We would say this is the gospel being multiplied. This is the gospel advancing. Paul's down in Corinth writing this letter, and he actually writes to them and says, pray that the gospel would advance rapidly in Corinth. But he's looking out, seeing that the gospel has spread and multiplied greatly there from Thessalonica. And here's, I just want to pause and just make a note here. What we see in the book of Acts And sometimes what we miss, and it's a little bit odd, but what we see from churches, from these churches in these cities in the book of Acts, is that they are starting other churches. That's sort of their normative approach. The gospel is ringing out and other churches are being started. Part of a healthy church is just simply a church that starts other churches. One author said, it's natural and customary to see churches start churches in the book of Acts. Here's another scholar. He says it this way. The Bible envisions a church that is both a doctrinally sound organization and a growing dynamic organism. It's two things. The Bible envisions a church that is both a doctrinally sound organization, depth and substance, but also a dynamic and growing organism. And that's what we see here in the church in Thessalonica. Paul has lived out his strategy He arrives, he shares the gospel, God works, people believe, he begins to group them together, disciple them, form churches, and now this church is doing exactly the same thing. They're imitating Paul, as Paul in some ways imitated Jesus. If we were looking at churches in the scripture, I've already shared that Antioch is my favorite church. It's the mother church. It's Paul's home church where Paul and Silas came from. But this would be my second favorite church. I just love the church of Thessalonica to see how the gospel is ringing out from them. So that's our first question. That's how the church did. And it did quite well. And they become a model church, not only for other churches of their time, but for our time. But then the second question is this. How did Paul, in such a short time, one month, what did he infuse into this church that made such a difference? That led to such impact in people's lives. And that still gets back to our initial question of what can we do? What's one simple thing we can do to make a difference? And Paul writes this. You're going to see it. Let me read it for you. You'll see it on the screens. Here's what Paul writes. He says this. Because we loved you so much, 
we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Let me just reflect on that verse. Paul says, because we loved you so much, and again, that's evident through the whole letter, Paul loved these people, and he loved this church. And then he says, I was delighted. There was great joy in me to share, to be a giver. My love led me out of my joy to give. And then what did Paul share? Well, we see two things. The first is he shared the gospel. He was determined to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And again, this should not surprise us. This has been Paul's strategy. We've seen it in every city. I feel like we've talked about that fairly significantly. And so not because I want to lessen its importance, but because we've already talked about it, I'm just going to leave that Paul shared the gospel with just stating that. But it's the second thing he shared. It's something we have not seen yet, have not something we have not marked. And here's what Paul says. I shared my life with you. Not only did I share the gospel, but we shared our lives as well. It's this deep love for these people. He pours out, another version says, we shared our very souls We poured out our souls to you. We gave of ourselves. We didn't just give a message, but we gave of ourselves. We gave whatever you needed to help. We shared our lives. We gave practically, and yes, of course, we met physical needs, but we also met spiritual needs. You may wonder, how did this happen? How does Paul become such a giver If you remember back when this series started, it was Easter Sunday, and Paul was a persecutor of the church. But what happened there on that day is Paul realized that even though he was opposed to Christ, that God loved him and had sent Jesus to die for him and forgive him. And in that moment there, in week number one, Paul on the Damascus Road receives from Jesus his love and his forgiveness of his sin, and Paul is changed in that moment. It's that moment that changes us. And when we then receive from Christ, now we are able to be givers. It first starts with receiving, and now it's giving, it's sharing, and that's what Paul's doing. He's received the gospel. He's received the love of Christ, and now he's turning around and sharing that out. So as we look at Thessalonica, and we try to bring these two things together, a church that was multiplying, and Paul and Silas and Timothy who were sharing their lives. Here's my simple summary of what we see. You'll see a slide for it. It says it this way. Where the gospel multiplies, people share their lives. Where the gospel multiplies, people share their lives. Yes, certainly part of the gospel multiplication was Paul's strategy. It was simple. It was reproducible. They learned it in a month, and they picked it up, and they started doing it. It was faith in the power of the gospel. But the fuel, the soil, the atmosphere, the environment by which the gospel multiplied was not a cold, impersonal environment. It was a loving, it was a sharing of lives with one another. How was Paul able to make such a difference in a city in such a short period of time? We see the answer here. He shared his life. He gave of his very soul to the people. And they felt both the message and his love and the connection of life. And it led to this church then replicating that out. The gospel ringing out forward from them. So harbor Here's our application. Let's let the gospel ring out from us. Let's let the gospel ring out in Niagara. Let's let the gospel ring out in Ontario. Let us be a church that shares Jesus. Let's share the gospel with people. Now, if you've, you know me and you know my, my deep and growing passion that we would be a church that would share the gospel. And I know some of you, you've heard this before, and here's what you're saying. Jeff, I'm just not ready. I'm just not ready to share the gospel. And here's, and again, I understand that and I want to give grace, but I also want to say let's not let a little social awkwardness not share the gospel. Let's keep being people that share the gospel. Too much is at stake to not be sharing the gospel. But I know some of you are just saying, I'm just not ready. 
I'm just not ready for that. And if you're in that category, I don't want to give you an excuse to get out of sharing the gospel, but I also want to add something else then. Yes, let's share the gospel, but Harbor, let's also share our lives with one another. Let's love each other. Let's care. Let's come alongside. Let's greet and welcome. Let us invest in one another. And someone else who is sharing with Jesus, sharing Jesus with someone else, you know what they're longing for? They're longing for others to come along and join them to be a community of love who loves people that are far from God, to engage, to walk with, to be a friend, to be, to create a community for them. It's this one thing, Harbor, that we can all do. We can all share our lives with one another that makes an immense difference. Think back to my story of Larry there. You may think it was his great woodworking skill that made a difference. What really made the difference is I reflect back on what Larry did. And it's more significant now than it was at the time as I reflect back on it. He shared his life. Those kids loved him. They would come in the room and they would want to run up and give him a big hug. They called him Uncle Larry. And at times as they'd be working on their woodwork and he'd wrap his arms around them and he'd instruct them. Sometimes he'd yell at them because they weren't doing things right. But it was just this sense of love in that room. And as I thought about Uncle Larry, what he did in that woodworking class that made such a difference is that he shared his life with those kids, and that made a difference. So Harbor, let us be a place where we share our lives with one another. So I've given the principle here. I've given the principle, but now let me just give two really practical ways, one personally and then one together that we can do. One is sort of a, a clear action step that you each, we each can take, and another one, sort of a vision, a heart for how God may want to grow us around here as a church. So individually, here's the verse, here's the practical way we share our lives with each other. It's Romans 12, 13, practice hospitality. Paul just gives it as a command. Practice hospitality. Now, now I know, I know we're in a global pandemic right now. I am aware of that, and I'm aware that some of you are not comfortable in the current season practicing hospitality, and that's okay. We want to give honor and grace in that regard. But here's what I know. At some point, we're all going to become comfortable again sharing hospitality. Some of you are there now, and some of you will get there, Lord willing, over the next couple of months. So whenever we get there, whenever we get there, whenever you feel comfortable, here's my request. Can we redouble our efforts to practice hospitality? We've had right now 15 months where we have a limited opportunity to share our lives with one another. And so as you then begin to feel more comfortable, can you just be saying now in your heart, I'm going to practice hospitality. I'm going to engage and I'm going to increase my level of sharing my life with one another. And it's a real simple way to do it. Just practice hospitality. Just have people into your space and share some food together. If you want this even simpler, here's the way you can advance the gospel at Harbor. Have someone over to your house and serve them a bowl of ice cream. It's that simple. And if we could all do that If we could all do that and increase our efforts in hospitality, God would help, God would use that to advance and multiply the gospel from our church. So that's the personal way. Let me just give you also the corporate way, the way we could do that together. And a verse I've selected is Galatians 6 2. It says, Carry one another's burdens. And it just reminds us that we all are carrying burdens and we all need to help each other in that. Here's what we know. Life is hard. And for some people over the last 15 months, life has become unmanageable and the hardness of life has grown. We are seeing increased hurts, increased pains, and increased needs. And so what you're going to see in a moment on the side screen is I've sort of divided these needs and hurts into three categories, and then I've come up with five ideas for each category. So the slide is full. You may need to come back to it and pause it at another date, but it just gives you some of the opportunities, some of the needs and hurts that exist. So let's see the slide now. 
I'll give a quick summary of it. You see relational needs in marriage, in parenting, in family. You see healthy living needs to deal with finances and grief and anxiety and physical health. You see the need for safe places with destructive behaviors and addictions and anger and codependency, and the list goes on. There's at least 15 different ministries listed there. The good thing about all of that list there is there's resources available that have been produced. These are not new needs. There are resources available to help churches meet these needs. And here's what we're praying for. This is not an announcement this morning. But here's what we're praying for that's in our heart as a church, that God might raise up more people in our midst, more leaders who would say, I have a skill and I have a giftedness and I have a passion in one of those areas. And I would long to build a ministry, not just to do a class, but to build a ministry that would really minister and come alongside where I could really share my life and I could, we together could share our lives to help some of the hurts and the pains and the needs that exist in our church and in our community. So that's what we're praying for. You know, I think back to Larry. He, got, he was raised up to do woodworking. Today, God may be using even what I'm saying to raise up a few people at Harbor who have the gifts and the skills and the abilities to be raised up in some of these areas where we as a church could really be meeting the real hurts and the needs that exist. And, and those are in our church, and those are increasingly in our community. So that's the story of Thessalonica. Paul's there one month. He follows his strategy. He shares the gospel, but he also shares his life. And it's the sharing of that life that then ripples out into that church and ripples out into the surrounding communities. And oh God, may you give us grace as a church to do that. Imagine Harbor. Just imagine if over the next three months, each of us increased our practice of hospitality by 10%, just one or two times from what we're doing now, just one or two extra moments of hospitality in a month. And you imagine if God raised up two or three people to lead a ministry that would enable us to meet the hurts and the pains. Here's what you know. If just in doing those simple things, as you would think that through over the next three, six months, the gospel would advance from our church. The gospel would ring out. The gospel would multiply here. Let me pray that that would be the case. God, we thank you for Paul's example today. God, we thank you, Lord, that he not only shared the gospel, but he shared his life. And God, thanks for the reminder that love matters. To love each other deeply and fervently matters. And God, may you help us to do that. Help us to share our lives with one another. Help us to do that individually. And God, as a church, may you help us to do that corporately. And we pray this in your name. Amen and amen. Harbor, we say four words to end every service. And as you would think about sharing your life with one another this week, Harbor, we are sent.